necessarily expect. And look at that. We finally seem to have, uh, and of course there's no audio. Um, uh, what a, just an absolute nightmare. Um, let's see. Is there a way? Tags, yada, yada, yada. All right. Um, you know what? I'm going to unplug this. Testing one, two, three. If you can hear me on YouTube, looks like we are up and running. I just don't know why this is being this way. All right. You know what? Um, we are just going to have to power on. It looks like uh, I don't know what is going on with YouTube, but it's just being a pain in the behind, much like a, a Dan Mullen. So um, we will let's let's see. That does nothing for me. All good here. All right. Looks like we're up and good on YouTube and hopefully you guys can hear me. I don't necessarily know if you can right now. Um, first off defensive back coach opening. Yes. Charlton Warren is now the defensive back co or the defensive coordinator, I should say. at Indiana, he was hired there over the weekend. That means Georgia has an opening at the defensive backs position. This is, you know, something pretty standard uh, that comes when you are running a program like Georgia. If you're a coach like Warren, it's a chance to move up. And you saw this past year with, Indiana's defensive coordinator getting hired as a head coach at South Alabama, Kane Womack. So from his standpoint, well, yes, the Georgia defensive backs job is very good. Being a Big Ten defensive coordinator, it's not a bad place to be, especially if you can hit your wagon to a guy like Tom Allen, who really seemed to turn the corner this year there at Indiana. So going for there, what that means, I won't, I've already kept you guys waiting on Facebook long enough. Uh, we'll start with talking about Will Muschamp. He is – it's the worst-kept secret in, in and around Athens right now. He has been around that program, uh, around the Georgia program. I don't think he's going to get this defensive back job. I'm not even necessarily sure he wants this for a, a couple of different reasons. One, you know, he's getting, I think, $15 million from South Carolina, so he doesn't have to take a job unless he just wants to take a job. Two, if for anyone that's ever been around the Georgia practice or watched Kirby Smart in there, he is very hands-on with the defensive backs. And that it's not necessarily an easy job when you have one of the best defensive backs coaches in the country working there and working that position sort of like, uh, you know, sort of like a, if you're a quarterback coach at Florida, Dan Mullen's going to be very involved in that room. So it's, it, it's a tough job to sort of balance, okay, I got to work with these guys, but I also have to be deferential to Kirby Smart given – what Kirby Smart is and can do there for Georgia. So going from there, you know, Muschamp, I expect him to ultimately end up as an analyst in, in some form or fashion with Georgia, take a year off, reevaluate, see what happens with the Georgia staff and where things sort of go from there and figure it out. Uh, a couple other, I would say, and BA and I talked about this on his show this morning, sort of bigger name pipe names, uh, Corey Raymond, defensive backs coach at LSU, uh, Tavares Robinson, who I believe now is technically the Miami defensive backs coach. Um, Raymond was the guy that interviewed for the job two years ago, ultimately ended up sticking at LSU. Robinson was Muschamp's defensive coordinator at South Carolina. He had a very good track record of developing defensive backs. I personally don't believe Raymond is going to end up coming to Georgia. As great of a job as I think Georgia's defensive backs coach is, and you look at the last two, they've been hired to go on to bigger and better jobs. Uh, Mel Tucker taking the head coaching job at Colorado before ending up at Michigan State last year. And then you look at Warren going to Indiana's defensive coordinator. But that LSU defensive backs job is one of the most cush jobs in the country. You get to be around great players. You have a very easy sales pitch when you look at some of the guys that have been through there. Tyron Matthew, Patrick Peterson, Morris Claiborne. Derek Stingley is going to be a top five pick next season. Elias Ricks is a very good player. As well, it's one of the few positions where it really recruits itself and you don't have to necessarily do a whole lot there. And he's already survived sort of one coaching turnover there when Les Miles left and they brought in Ed Ogeron. So it sounds like Raymond, is he's a guy who's played at LSU, has some real stability there. So I don't necessarily know how much he might really seriously consider leaving LSU um, to take Georgia job. I do know that LSU's had a tough time finding a defensive coordinator. Uh, I believe their latest candidate, Ryan Nielsen of the New Orleans Saints, he ultimately passed on that job. So that'll be something worth monitoring going forward as well. And Tavares Robertson, he just took that job at Miami. If Georgia could get him, that's a win. But again, I, I, I think he might be settled in and, and okay with and ready to go forward with Miami 
and because he does have those South Florida roots. And, you know, and Georgia certainly, I think if you look at Tyreek Stevenson, a guy who's from Miami, ends up leaving and going back to Miami, I think Georgia, if they want a greater recruiting presence there down there in South Florida, I think he's a guy – that could sort of be targeted and looked at. Uh, another name that had been mentioned recently, Doug Belk. Uh, he'd worked with Kirby Smart before when they were both at Alabama. Uh, Belk was in a support staff role. He actually ends up getting a promotion today from Houston. He goes from being their safeties and defensive backs coach there to being their now defensive coordinator under Daniel Hogelson. He was a guy whose name had been floated around early out there as a name to watch. A couple other I would say lower tier names, but names that maybe aren't as high on the sort of fans conscious or point of view. Marcus Woodson, he's the defensive backs coach at Florida State. He was the defensive backs coach at um, Memphis when Dan Lanning was there in 2016 and 2017. He is also someone that has SEC experience. He has worked at Auburn. Uh, He worked at Auburn for the previous two years, played a big role in developing a lot of the really good defensive backs and recruiting a lot of the good defensive backs you've seen come through there. Last season, Noah, and I'm going to butcher his name, Ingbenogany, ends up going as a first-round pick to the Miami Dolphins. So he's got a very good track record. I guess the question is, would he leave Florida State there? Because it seems like the Seminoles are really committed to work, making things work with Mike Norvell, given some of the turnover and, and challenges that that position and that coaching job has had since Jimbo Fisher left there. And then a sort of internal in-staff guy to really keep an eye on, I would say, is Nick Williams. He's a guy who played defensive back in high school, played at Georgia, ultimately moved down to linebacker, has been on the staff for a while, and really a well-regarded recruiter, played a big role in recruiting Keely Ringo, played a big role in recruiting Lewis Seen, and is someone who – this is where Kirby Smart's expertise as a defensive backs coach can sort of help bridge that gap a little bit to where, yes, he would be a first-time on-field coach, but with all that he has brought to the Georgia program already, and you have sort of a, a great defensive backs coach in Kirby Smart already on staff, I think that might be a nice little meeting of the two. And Williams is certainly someone who sooner rather than later is going to be on Georgia's staff on an on-field role in some capacity. It's just is it a question of his defensive backs. Is it when, when Dan Lanning ultimately moves on, where does he go? Uh, Williams seems like someone primed to ultimately be an on-field uh, coach for Georgia in the seasons to come. So that's sort of the names to know right now for that defensive back opening. We'll see. I don't expect Georgia to move all that quickly on this. I know there's some concern out there. Terry and Arnold, Georgia's last major target when it comes to recruiting the 2021 class. But Arnold's a guy who has a really strong relationship with Kirby Smart. And ultimately I think the school he picks because he looks at Florida, another one of his finalists, they fired both the quarterbacks coach and their safeties coach, Alabama, his other finalists, has constant churn among the coaching staff there. So I think with Arnold, he's really looking at this from a head coaching standpoint. And Smart, if you've read Jeff Sintel, he's been very, very, um, very hands-on in the recruitment of Arnold and and spoken of him a lot. And Arnold, conversely, has spoken very highly of Kirby Smart. So while ultimately it is a small blow, I believe, to see Warren take that Indiana job when it comes to Arnold, I still expect if Georgia's to land his recruitment at the end of the day, it's going to be because – Georgia has Kirby Smart recruiting him. So we'll have that. And that sort of ties things up a little bit for the defensive backs job. We'll touch next. We're going to move to Dan Lanning. Uh, On Friday, it seemed like around 5 o'clock that Dan Lanning was going to be the next defensive coordinator at Texas. Uh, It was a report from Dennis Dye that he was considered the favorite. Uh, Depending on who you read and, and reporting and whatnot, it seemed like it was a job he was very much considering taking. I know Texas, they have a ton of money and almost certainly was going to pay Dan Lanning quite a lot. And even in the middle of a pandemic, I, I think with him staying at Georgia, I would not be surprised in the slightest to see Lanning, excuse me, get a little bit of a pay bump after this past season, even though the defense did struggle against Florida and Alabama. Georgia actually still finished first in the country, or first in the SEC, I should say, in yards per play allowed. So while, yes, those two big games do stick out for Georgia – it was still a pretty darn, darn good defense. And, you know, with already a lot of turnover there in the secondary with Richard the Count, Mark Webb, Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell, DJ Daniel, all gone, Tyreek Stevenson now as well. Having some continuity, especially within that front seven, I think is going to make things a lot easier for the rest of the Georgia defense in 2021. I think that front seven is going to be, you know, as good as any in the country. I think the other one that has a case there, Clemson and, and Alabama, they both return a lot up there. Uh, I believe somebody in here mentioned, yeah, Clemson now returns all 11 starters from this year's defense. Now, I would point out that 
Ohio State exposed that defense in a way that, you know, all great defenses these days, I think, do get exposed against these elite offenses because the reality nowadays is that great wide receiver play, if you have it, if you have great wide receivers and great quarterbacks, it's just going to beat the best defense you can throw out there. Uh, Eric Stokes, Devontae Smith, I think, showed that on that last big touchdown Alabama had where Stokes was in great coverage, great position, and Matt Jones just happened to put a ball where only Devontae Smith could catch it, tapped his feet down and got a touchdown there. So the reality is, as tough as it is replacing defensive guys, and yes, I do still think they're important, especially against lesser competition where you look at a team like Kentucky that always seems to do a good job against Georgia's offense, but having a defense of Georgia's caliber I think makes things a lot easier in those games, whereas it's those big games – against the Clemson, which Georgia opens up against next year. Uh, Alabama in the SEC title game, but potentially Ohio State, Oklahoma in the college football playoff. Those games you have to win with your offense. Uh, you look back even to that Rose Bowl, final score in that game was 54-48. Georgia was going to have to score a lot of points to win that game. Ultimately, they did most of their work on the ground there. But it, it just the way college football is nowadays, you have to win with offense. So Dan Lanning coming back I think is great. I think it, it keeps continuity with this Georgia team. A keeps a, de- a strong defense, a defense that I think will have one of the best front sevens. Um, while, yes, you do lose Aziz Ojolari, and he's a very, very good player, I think, from a pass rushing standpoint. Uh, with Adam Anderson coming back, with Nolan Smith emerging to do a little bit more there, I, I think it's encouraging of what that group can do next year, especially now with landing back for another season. So we'll sort of tie things off there with Dan Lanning. He announced he is coming back. Texas actually has filled that role now. It is Pete Kwiatkowski. Uh, he was the Washington defensive coordinator. I'm sure he's going to get a, a, a nice chunk of change to go be the defensive coordinator down there for Steve Sarkeesian in Austin. Uh, two other notes. Um, Glenn Schumann is a name I would still keep an eye on these next couple of days. Oregon has still not hired a defensive coordinator, and LSU is still trying to figure out who they might hire as a defensive coordinator, and they've missed on a lot of top candidates at this point. I think Schumann is one of, is a future defensive coordinator. I think he's a future head coach. Uh, Money Rice has said he is the smartest coach on Georgia's staff. He relates very well with his players. They landed Xavier Sori and Jamel Munden in his past class ago, along with Jamon Dumas Johnson and Chaz Chambliss. Uh, he is an excellent recruiter. Um, we'll see what LSU ultimately decides to do. They've sworn and missed on just about every big candidate that they've gone off after at this point. And, and then the Oregon job is actually maybe a little bit more interesting there because there's some more ties with Oregon to the Georgia program than you might think. Mario Cristobal, the former offensive line coach at Alabama when Kirby Smart was there, they have a relationship, and, and I'm sure that he knows Schumann as well since they were all sort of on the same staff there. And Oregon's head strength coach right now, Aaron Feld, you might remember his mustache. Uh, he was a former Georgia strength and uh, conditioning coach in his time in Athens. So. There are quite a few connections between uh, Oregon and Georgia, and obviously they're going to play, I believe, to kickstart the 2022 season uh, in Atlanta. So it, it, it's worth watching. We'll see what happens there. Obviously, Dog Nation will report on it as things sort of come out and where things go from there. But uh, ultimately, I think at this point, I would still probably bet on Glenn Schumann being back and really Georgia's defensive backs coach being the only one that Georgia really needs to replace going forward. So – uh, we're about the 14, 15 minute mark on YouTube here, 18 minutes on Facebook. That's, that's not great. Um, but that's just the problems we had with YouTube night resetting things. My name is Connor Riley. We're here with dog nation, uh, do a little Tuesday night chat, giving you some information, what we're hearing, what we're learning, uh, some stuff to look forward to. We'll take your questions here at the end a little bit. We got three more things I want to hit on. We'll do the two sort of newsy ones where I can get on a soapbox and preach a little bit. And then we'll sort of, do a thing that I think will open it up to you guys and and fuel a really good discussion here to end the show tonight. Um, There were two departures yesterday in the world of college football, and they are both tangentially uh, tied to Georgia. Um, Justin Fields of Ohio State officially ended his college career career uh, declared for the NFL draft. And then I think maybe an hour after that, Tennessee decides that it is going to fire Jeremy Pruitt and Phil Fulmer is going to retire. We'll touch on Fields first and then go into Pruitt a little bit since there's probably some more thoughts and conversations about Pruitt in that Tennessee situation and what they decide to do. Fields, a stellar college career, led Ohio State to -to back-to-back playoff appearances, led them to a college football playoff title game this year. There were times where he looked like the best player on the field. I expect him to be a top-five pick. 
But the reason Georgia fans care so much and are so interested in him and would seem to follow his great games and his not-so-great games, and he did have a few of those, especially Northwestern and Indiana this year, was the connection to Georgia. And I know there were a lot of Georgia fans out there that were sort of nervously watching that national title game, not maybe outright rooting against Justin Fields, but hoping that he wouldn't win and that Ohio State would win because then you'd have to hear it from the Floridas to Auburns, Tennessees, the Alabama fans out there saying, oh, you had this quarterback on your team and you couldn't win a title with him. And the reality is that I think where I come down on this is I don't blame Justin and I don't think anyone should for making a decision he made in 2018. He didn't think that there was going to be a chance for him to beat out Jake Fromm, fair or unfair, and went to a place where he was going to be able to A, contend for a national title and B, be a starter right away. And Ohio State gave him that and he didn't have that at Georgia. And obviously there are a lot of people say, oh, you could have coached him into leaving at Jake Fromm was the better quarterback in 2018. I think in 2018, he gave Georgia the better chance to win. And you, you look at this transfer portal stuff, you look at a guy like Kid Mays or Tyree Stevenson, you have to do everything you can to win now eh? because the championship window is so finite and it can seem wide open one year. And then the next year, you look at a program like LSU where things sort of go off the rails a little bit. So when you have a chance to win a national title, I, I think you have to go for it. And ultimately, I, I do think in 2018 – Kirby made the right decision sticking with with Fromm, but maybe for 19 and 20, it wasn't the correct decision. I, I will say, I think with what we saw from Alabama this past year and what we saw from LSU the year before, even if Justin Fields is on those Georgia teams, I still think Alabama beats both of those teams. Uh, I, Georgia played LSU, lost by 27. That's four touchdowns, and that game was not all that close. Georgia's offense really, really struggled that day. I don't think they, they had the offensive horses around Fields on that 2019 team to sort of get Georgia where it needed to be. And then in 2020, yes, Georgia had a 24-20 lead at halftime, a 20-24 lead into the third quarter. And Stetson Bennett, the wheels sort of started to come off there in the second half in Tuscaloosa that night. But for everyone that wants to point to the quarterback play in that game and what Justin Fields might have been able to do, and Stetson Bennett scored 24 points against Alabama. That's the same number that Fields had against Ohio State. Alabama ended that game on offense with Georgia's defense as good as it was, going touchdown, touchdown, touchdown and then a six-minute drive to end the game. I, this Alabama offense was just better than Georgia and what Georgia had this year. It was one of the great offenses of the modern time. The offensive line was fantastic, much better than Georgia's. I think we've talked here before about what Georgia's needs to do for 2021 is sort of be that bona fide title contender. And I think the offensive line just has to get better, and I think that's that's pretty pretty much it, really. So Fields moves on, doesn't win a title. I, I think Georgia fans can collectively breathe. I think we won't hear about the Fromm Fields thing anymore. I think Kirby needs to, you know, obviously winning a title next year goes a long way in just ending all sorts of those discussions. But all things considered, the Fields thing didn't end as bad as a lot of people thought it potentially could. So, um, you know, you wish him the best. I know there are a lot of fans out there that would love to see him on the Falcons. So we'll sort of wait and see where he goes and what happens with him with regards to the NFL draft. So we're about the 18-minute mark here on YouTube. 23 on Facebook. We're going to move to Jeremy Pruitt here in the boondoggle that is uh, University of Tennessee football program at this point in time. Uh, Tennessee announced yesterday that Phil Fulmer, the athletic director that hired Jeremy Pruitt and gave him an extension, uh, I believe back in September, he will be retiring. Jeremy Pruitt has been fired with clause with, uh, yeah, with cause, excuse me. Brian Niedemeyer, uh, linebackers coach, a very well-regarded recruiter, has gone head-to-head with a number of Georgia prospects, Darnell Washington and Marius Mims. He has been fired with cause. Shelton Felton, uh, a name you might know if you follow the Big Cat Bryant and Quay Walker recruitments, he has been fired as well, along with five other off-field staffers for Tennessee. Uh, There's an NCAA investigation where Tennessee is alleging there are level one and level two uh, recruiting violations. Those are the most serious violations you have out there. Obviously, there's Dan Patrick saying Georgia got sloppy in recruiting. I don't put a lot of credence into that. I know the McDonald's bag thing was going out and going around there today. I don't put a whole lot of credence into that. And it, it's, you know, a, a well-respected radio host sort of going for headlines and, and trying to sort of, you know, if it was someone from ESPN reporting that, I think I'd feel a little bit differently about it. So uh, reality is Tennessee's a mess right now. It has been a mess for, Basically, the entirety of my college football educated watching life, um, Tennessee's last 10-win season came in 2007. They are now beyond their fifth head coach since then. Georgia has five SEC East titles since that point in time. 
It is just, it is a job that thinks it is still 1998 that can be a dominant national power. And they're just one great coaching hire away from sort of getting there and being the program that they once were. When the reality is they need adults in the room there at Tennessee. They need people who are sound decision makers who are going to be able to weather the storms, good and bad. Uh, I was thinking about it today. For as unpopular as Greg McGarity was, and believe me, he's very unpopular, and I bet based on some of the comment sections out there, he's still unpopular. But the one thing that I would say is he was always an adult. He always had was able to weather the storms of popular and unpopular decisions. I thought he handled the firing of Mark Drick about as well as anyone could. Uh, he is greatly – accelerated and improved the facilities here around Georgia, not just on the football side, but in a, a various number of other ones. He was the adult in the room, so to speak, for this Georgia program, whereas Tennessee, it, it hasn't had that. They've cycled through presidents. They've cycled through chancellors. They're going to have to find a new athletic director, and the interim coach that takes over there, Kevin Steele, he's going to be a guy who I actually think will coach the 2021 season because Tennessee has said they want to hire their athletic director first before hiring the next head coach, which I think is honestly uh, uh, the right way to go about this because Tennessee, with what Tennessee wants to be, they want to be a Georgia. They want to be an Alabama. They want to be a Florida. They want to be a program that contends for the playoff, contends for SEC titles, and a, they will not be doing that in 2021, regardless of who they hire. They can try and bring him new freeze. I don't think they're going to bring him in just because of the baggage that he had at Ole Miss, both in terms of an NCAA investigation, which they are firing Pruitt for, and so are the off-field issues there as well. So if I'm Tennessee and trying to fix them, you have to do what is best and right for you. And actually, it's pretty funny. I was talking with some friends today. You look at the Auburn situation. Auburn wanted to bring in Kevin Steele as its head coach. It sounds like that's what the boosters were really pushing for. And Alan Green sort of stood up and said, no, we're not giving in a booster culture. That's what got us into this situation where we gave Gus Malzahn this massive extension and our program is sort of hemming and hawing these last couple of years. He said, we're going to stand firm. We're going to go out and try and hire the best possible candidate and the best coach for this job. And while I'm, I have been lukewarm on, on Brian Harson, I think he's a much better head coach than I do think of what Kevin Steele was going to potentially be there at Auburn. So ultimately Tennessee needs to figure out, Hey, if we want to be, if we want to be serious football players here, if we want to not just dominate social media chatter and dominate the message boards, we need to get our house in order. We need to be patient. You look at the last couple of, you look at Butch Jones and Jeremy Pruitt. The first time anything really went wrong for those two coaches, Butch Jones four and eight, and he didn't even finish that 2017 season. And then Jeremy Pruitt's three and seven year this year, they packed it in and circled things and cycled things out and said, all right, we're starting over again. And Butch Jones, you know, I don't want to sound like Mike Griffith here, but didn't do that bad of a job, you know, back-to-back nine win seasons, top 25. I know he wasn't getting to where you wanted to ultimately see Tennessee football be for a lot of people, but they're at least somewhat respectable. And yes, they lost some games that they shouldn't have. Uh, they, they cost themselves a new year six bowl loss with a loss to Vanderbilt, but Ultimately, I think Tennessee, the biggest thing they just need is, is maturity and patience from the decision-making level. And if they get that, if they nail that athletic director hire and, and bring in someone that is going to steer the ship confidently and not give in to mob rule that we have sort of seen. And, and for the record, I didn't think the Shiano hire in Tennessee was all that great. It, it was just, you know, after that and, and seeing what, if you were deemed unpopular by this mob rule, I think it turned off a lot of potential coaching candidates to that job. Uh, there are a lot of pros to that Tennessee job. Nashville is an exploding city from a population standpoint. Uh, Tennessee is a pretty good high school football state, and I believe you're going to continue uh, to sort of see that. So if you can recruit Nashville well, if you can recruit Memphis well, Jerry Pruitt showed you can establish and get good players out of the state of Georgia, specifically out of the metro Atlanta area, and bring them up to Tennessee. There's a blueprint there to where, you know, year one, year two, you're not going to do what Kirby Smart did at Georgia where you go – from unranked in an eight and five first year to playing for a national title and very near winning one your second season. Tennessee is not that job at this point in time. And for, I, I actually wrote about this today for all the comparisons people wanted to make from Pruitt small, because that's what Tennessee, I think sort of thought that they were getting when they hired him back in prior to the 2018 season. Pruitt never recruited as well as Kirby Smart did his highest ranked class finished 10th. Kirby Smart's lowest uh, of his full recruiting classes that has finished so far is third. 
So Smart was always a better recruiter. The biggest issue with Pruitt was just that he could never figure out that quarterback situation up there. Even when they bring in a guy like Harrison Bailey, who's supposed to be the quarterback of the future. And this year they had a chance to really commit to him and give him Raz next. I want to see patience from that. I want to see a mature adult plan. You can't let the 18 year olds or the, the mob mob mentality sort of run that program anymore. Otherwise, every time you have a bad season or a struggling season, it's going to turn and you're going to have to fire a coach and start all over again. So we'll ultimately sort of see what goes on there. Yeah. The McDonald's thing, it's funny. It is what it is. I don't put a lot of stock in it. So we'll sort of move on from there. And uh, we'll go to our last sort of big topic here. Who do you think, and I want to open this up to you guys and I'll share some thoughts on a little bit. Who do you guys think is the best player on Georgia's 21 2021 team not most important I think we all agree that's JT Daniels not most talented or the guy that has the highest ceiling I think that's George Pickens so but it, the question with George is always will he reach that ceiling who do you think is the pound for pound best football player on Georgia's team I wrote about this a little bit today I, I think it's it's Jordan Davis I think he's a guy who he's not going to put up big stats but from an impact standpoint he makes it so hard for teams to run against you. He had, had a absolute draftable grade this year and elected to come back to be a face of the program type guy. And yeah, Crow King, Jason Crosby both weighing in, saying it is Jordan Davis as well. He he, he shuts off the faucet in the run game and makes, makes offenses one-dimensional. I think you look at that Missouri game to really get a, a sense of the away from the stat sheet uh, impact where – Missouri, a team that was a very good offense in the second half of the season, could not really move the ball or do much of anything in that game with Davis in there. Uh, and then even in that Cincinnati game, he actually made impact plays. He had a sack in that game. He had a huge block field goal, which, you know, of course, at the end of that game, it's a very different game if Tennessee, if uh, Cincinnati has 24 points and Georgia has to drive for a touchdown there at the end, as opposed to just having 21 where they can play for the field goal. So. So, you know, what do you guys think uh, and where that might be? I saw Alex Howard saying Kendall Milton. I'll push back there a little bit. I think Kendall's going to be a tremendous running back. Um, he's got to stay on the field. He missed time with a knee injury this year, and he did show some flashes. Uh, he had a nice reception there in the Peach Bowl against Cincinnati. But right now he's got a loaded depth chart ahead of him. Guys like Kenny McIntosh, Samir White, James Cook. All do things similar, and while I think Kendall might be the best runner that Georgia has, Zamir is a better pass blocker. James Cook is better with the ball in his hands. Uh, Kenny McIntosh is a great special teams player and does really well changing directions and made some huge catches there at the end of that Peach Bowl. So while Kendall is absolutely a very talented runner, and if this is the best player on the 2022 team or 2023 team, I think Kendall is absolutely a name we have to include in there. But for, for 2021 – uh, he might fall into the more talented category, but I don't know if pound for pound best uh, is is what we'll see there. Um, Croaking brings up um, George Pickens. Pickens is a guy where if he puts it all together, he can absolutely be the best player on the field uh, against the Clemson and Alabama and whatnot. And we've seen him do it. I think it was really encouraging. The end of the season, those last two games with JT Daniels at quarterback, Pickens was an absolute monster on the field there for Georgia. Uh, Cincinnati game, hundred you know, over 100 yards, two touchdowns, made some really big catches in that Cincinnati game against a really good Cincinnati defense. So the, the thing with George is just can he put it all together consistently over the course of a full season? He did miss some time this past year, and, and his numbers were really down with Stetson Bennett out there. So uh, you get a full year with JT. Maybe that really does unlock George Pickens to reach his full potential because – uh, in terms of if he when he puts things ever all and everything together, he both has the impact that Jordan Davis has away from the box sheet or uh, score sheet in terms of stretching a defense and making you sort of shift the dynamics of the way an opposing defense plays, and he he's able to put up you know five catches, 112 yards, and two touchdown type games pretty easily. So I, I think that's a really good one uh, to throw out there as well. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Tennille Calvinio says Jordan Davis instinctively. I, I think that's the guy, uh, that most people are, are coming up with. Um, let's see. Comments, thoughts, questions. We can open this up obviously to other things you might want to talk about questions, thoughts. Um, Terrence Dennis. Yeah. He does bring up JT Daniels need him to rise to his potential. Uh, 
there are moments like the Mississippi State game where it looked really good. I, I think that Cincinnati game gave you an, a little bit of oh, okay, he still got he still got some ways to go to get better, which should excite you, I think, as a Georgia fan because it does give you um it, it does give you a lot of hope that hey, this is a guy that threw for 392 yards, let a game winning drive, and didn't quite frankly play all that well in that game. So imagine if he sort of figured things out. I know. Mike Griffith had Peter Burns on last night with him sort of talking about how Matt Jones got those last couple of games at the end of Alabama season a year ago and the role that played with this Alabama offense in terms of propelling them forward. So uh, I think Daniels is absolutely a guy, again, we sort of touched on most important players for Georgia. It's absolutely number one, JT Daniels. He needs to be, he needs to be very good to great for Georgia to get to where it wants to next season and be in those Alabama games that Clemson, those Florida games, be a difference maker and a winner for Georgia because they, quite frankly, just didn't have that at the quarterback position this year when they played Alabama and Florida. Um, Kitten Smith brings up an interesting name, the Kobe Dean. He's a guy who, again, has made incremental improvements every year. It was a really came out of the came out as a freshman, really talented, really hot, played really well in that first fall camp. Gets injured right before the end of it, and I think that sort of slowed the growth process for him to start the season. And he got better as the season went along. And then I think this year. With Monty Rice being a little bit banged up, a little bit injured, they asked him to do a little bit more, and he looked at times really good. He's fantastic in pass coverage and a real difference maker there. And I think going into this next season with a guy like Jordan Davis in front of him really opening things up to make plays, I look for Nicobe Dean to take a big leap forward, and it wouldn't surprise me if a year from now we're talking about him like he's an All-American linebacker without a doubt and a real difference maker there for Georgia. So he is definitely someone who I think you could consider – you know, right now it might be a little bit of a stretch, but if we're forecasting this towards the end of the 2021 season, I think that's a name you absolutely have to put out there. Um, let's see. Um, Keith Lamb brings up Lewis Seen. Yeah, great tackler, hard hitter. What I want to see from Lewis this this coming season, I want to see him sort of make the plays that Richard LeCount made, the interceptions, the pass breakups, the sort of big – sort of momentum swinging plays. Lewis is a fantastic tackler. And your point, he does have really good range. I want to see him take that next step and sort of see if he can become that playmaking safety, that both playmaker in the middle of the defense that forces interceptions, that forces turnovers to sort of make things go for this defense. Because the reality is you need those types of plays. If you're going to beat in Alabama, if you're going to beat in Ohio state, if you're going to beat in Oklahoma, or you're going to beat a, a Clemson going forward. Um, Crokering, uh, 123, I want to see what we do against Clemson, beat Clemson, and we deserve to be number one until someone proves us or Clemson is overrated. I will say, yeah, if Georgia beats Clemson next year to start the first week of the season, I think whichever team wins that game is going to be the number one team in the country coming week two. So I definitely think that that is what is on the line there uh, in Charlotte to open the season. Uh, Nolan Turner, the safety there for Clemson, announced today that he is coming back for his senior season. That means all 11 starters for Clemson's defense are coming back, but – and again, I think it's going to be great for Clemson. I again, once I expect them to win the ACC to be a college football playoff team. I think Georgia again is a team, you, and, and they might be a very different team come the end of the season than when Georgia gets them to start the beginning of the season. The biggest question for them is their offensive line just really got pushed around against Ohio State, and you lose Trevor Lawrence, you lose Travis Etienne, you lose your top two receivers, and yes, they're going to bring Justin Ross back, and EJ Williams is a guy that can really blossom. I think there. How that def- how that offensive line plays against Georgia is going to be is really going to determine who wins that game. And conversely, I, I think whoever has the better offensive line wins that first game uh, for Georgia or Clemson. If Clemson is able to get pressure on JT Daniels and make things tough, and they're going to have a very good defensive line in front seven next year, then Clemson probably wins. Conversely, if, if Jordan Davis shuts things off and and Adam Anderson and Nolan Smith get pressure on DJ Uyengale, then I think Georgia finds a way to win that game. So I think it really comes down to whoever has the better offensive line between Georgia and Clemson when they meet on September 4th, that's going to be who ends up winning that game. So we'll go there. Um, Croaking asked about Oklahoma. I believe they play Nebraska next year. That's sort of their marquee non-conference game. They'll win that. They'll be the favorite to win the big 12 though. Iowa state, I think he's going to make things very interesting for them. They bring back a lot of their team this year, and they did beat Oklahoma. So I think that's one to watch. I'll be interested to see what Texas does with Steve Sarkeesian in charge. Uh, While they're probably not at that Oklahoma level just yet, they have a lot of talent there, and 
with what we saw from Steve Sarkeesian this year, he can draw up a pretty dang good offense. So uh, John Green asked a good question here. Um, has the schedule been settled yet? No. The answer to that is no. The SEC has not announced their, their schedules. We do know the opponents. Georgia gets Ar- Arkansas at home. They go to Auburn as their SEC West foes. The home games this year are – I'm doing this off the top of my head because unfortunately I didn't get a chance to go any and cover any of these games this year. I believe it was Missouri, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Arkansas. And the mode games are Auburn, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, and then Florida in Jacksonville. So that's sort of the SEC schedule. I know they play Clemson to start the season. They're going to end the season with Georgia Tech. Not sure off the top of my head who the two group of five FCS teams are that Georgia will play next season, but that is something that will be announced eventually. When that is, I don't know. I I would not be surprised to see the SEC sort of do what it did this year where it sort of made it a television announcement in August. Maybe they do it in July, sort of tie it into SEC media days, sort of make it an event and it's something where everyone is talking about the SEC and its schedule at a time where it is traditionally not necessarily doing that. So – I think uh, that is what we will do there. Yeah, the home schedule next year. Uh, it, it's been a, it's been with the SEC setup. It, it's been a tough slate. Now, granted, a few uh, two years ago, uh, twenty nineteen, you got Notre Dame at home. That made up for everything. So, uh, yeah, I believe UAB and Charleston Southern are the home. Um. Are the uh, home games next year? And that UAB game might be a little interesting. Bill Clark's done a very good job with that program, and that's not exactly going to uh, be a pushover there. So, um, we'll probably call it on that. We're about forty minutes here on Facebook, thirty-seven on YouTube. Sorry, we couldn't get things going. Uh, technical issues with this laptop, which are really frustrating, but. Nonetheless, uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, tomorrow, Wednesday, Jeff Sintel before the Hedges. On Thursday, we have Cover 4. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Those usually are very uh, spirited debates there. Friday, I'm, I believe Michael do his Friday night mics. And then every Monday through Friday, you have Brandon Adams doing Dog Nation daily. Uh, stay tuned for Dog Nation for the latest. I'm sure we're going to have some coaching news regarding the defensive backs opening in the coming days. So, Hope everyone uh, has a great rest of their week. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll see you here next uh, next Tuesday night. See you.